Hey, good morning, everyone. Good morning. Nice to see you all here. Um, for those of you who don't know, I'm Steve Matushek, the head teacher here at Dharma Field. Um, and I'm going to introduce our guest speaker. Most of you uh, probably know who I am, and you probably know who Dokai is, so I'm just going to kind of keep it short. But Dokai is like Shokan. We get uh, Shokan and Dokai to visit us every fall, and it's always a pleasure for them to come speak. Um, and uh, Dokai is a, uh, he's a Dharma heir of uh, Katagiri Roshi, and so he's a Dharma brother of Steve's and Norm's. And I know it's uh, always a pleasure to hear Dokai give talks. He's the, um, the uh, are you the, still the guiding teacher at Hokioji, Dokai? Yeah, guiding teacher at the uh, Hokioji Zen practice community in uh, southeastern Minnesota. It's really a, a lovely practice space. So a place that I'm hoping Dharma Field can get to once we get our numbers back up again. So, so Dokai, I'm just going to go ahead and turn this over to you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Steve. Uh, and good morning to all of you. Uh, first off, uh, while I see there's a, a fair number of online uh, participants here, I, I believe it might be uh, one of your strategies or hopes to uh, get people back in the Zendo again. And that's what I think I have heard. And I, um, I can really appreciate that. <clears throat> As you uh, all know, when the pandemic hit, I think Zoom saved uh, a lot of our lives <laughs> at uh, at least Zen centers and, and things like that. So, and hopefully the, you know, pandemic is going downward. Uh, however, um, I, it's, it's not a, I don't think uh, Zooming is really a substitute for getting together in person and practicing together. I'm just speaking from personal experience. Um, I've noticed that uh, Hokyoji uses a lot of Zooming because we're way out in the middle of nowhere. <clears throat> and so we have daily Zazen with Zooming, even though we have two or three people who live here. But we also have uh, Sunday Dharma talks. In fact, there's one going on right now that we do by Zoom. And uh, even with our residents here, we don't actually get together for those Sunday Dharma talks. We usually do it from our own rooms. So it's a little strange because we would have the situation where I would get up in front of like two people and give a Dharma talk. And that's a, a kind of a little bit of a strange feeling. In any event, <clears throat> I'm just uh, here to encourage uh, you as much as possible to see if you can get back to the Zendo as much as possible. Um, we uh, here at Hokioji, we had a summer session of which um, I led with two other people, Daigaku um, uh, Rume and also Ray Ren Gumbo. And they refused to use Zoom. <laughs> it's like no Zoom for us for this session. I'm a little more on the edge. Yeah, but we have like three people, you know, one on the West Coast, one on the East Coast, that kind of thing. But they said no Zoom. So, <clears throat> so that's that. I'm, I'm not going to belabor the point. Oh, yeah. And then uh, Steve asked me, am I still the Hokyoji's guiding teacher? Well, uh, we're starting to look at um, a way in which I might not be that guiding teacher for a lot longer. I'm 72 years old. I've kind of, uh, I was very uh, enamored with um, Shoaku Okamura, who said like when he was 65 years old or something like that, says, well, I'm gonna uh, work until I'm 75 at San Sanchen, where he's the abbot. 
And then I'm going to concentrate after 75 on getting old and dying. That's going to be my practice. So, so I was like uh, pretty impressed with that. And particularly when he said it in his late 60s or something like that. <clears throat> and he followed through. He followed through. He turned 75 this year and he turned over the uh, Zen Center to uh, a, a, a former resident of Hokyoji, Hoko Jan Carnegas. So he followed through with that. So I did the same thing. I set it out there with the board of directors that at 75, I'm going to retire from my major responsibilities here at Hokioji. That's three years from now. So that presents a, a whole realm of uh, thoughts, but I'm not going to go into them right now. <laughs> But what I am going to talk about is uh, a book uh, from uh, Karie Roshi's uh, lectures edited by Steve Hagen called uh, You Have to Say Something. And the, uh, the chapter of the book is, is a title is uh, Using the Selfish Self. Zazen is good practice for us. We can call it perfume because it scents our life. Of course, whatever we practice scents our life. If, for example, you become an army officer, your life becomes very army-like. Even when you wear normal clothes, people can still smell your army clothes. Because I am a Zen priest from Japan, even when I wear Western clothes, people can still smell the monk on me. I cannot escape. So <clears throat> I like this uh, metaphor. In this case, it's a metaphor of Zazen is a perfum, perfume. Because it scents our life. I think a perfume works best when it's uh, applied with uh, subtlety. Uh, my... Uh, younger brother once uh, became aware of cologne. cologne. He was four years younger than me. He had a cognitive um, disability, rather severe, but he became acquainted with uh, cologne and what and the smell that it had. So he like uh, dumped a whole bottle of it on him, you know, and uh, and so you got within 20 feet of him and you could start smelling this cologne. <laughs> and, and like I say, he was cognitively, you know, not like probably every everyone else here. <clears throat> so it was one of the only admonitions I ever made to my brother. And uh, I said, Steve, you know, I think it'd be better if you just put a little bit of cologne, not the whole, whole, whole bottle. <laughs> on you uh, for your for your purpose and oddly enough he looked at me and uh it, with just really kind of intense eyes and he says okay Ron <laughs> it's like he never listened to me but under that statement he listened so it's a kind of a maybe when I read this sentence it has another kind of meaning for me <clears throat> So he says, of course, whatever we practice since our lives, uh, if you're an army officer, I think uh, most of us, if we started um, doing Buddhist practice when we were very young, particularly someone like me in the early 70s, there was some uh, kind of a consciousness that, um, you know, army people were not like the best people around in the world. And at least that was my idea, uh, misguided as it was. <clears throat> In any event, after a number of years here at Hokyoji, uh, a practitioner, a very pr a serious practitioner showed up and she had been in the army and her husband was a, a high ranking a military officer in the US Army. And so I needed to adjust my whole perception of people in our sangha coming from different places in 
their uh, lives. So at one point where he says here, because I'm a Zen priest, uh, people can still smell the monk on me. Um, at one point about, well, I think now it's been about six years ago, I, I had the uh, desire I lived here at Hokyoji for about 15 years. I mean, and this was the only place where I lived. But I had the desire to uh, maybe have some kind of life that was not a Zen monk kind of life, at least not the primary presentation. So I got an apartment in La Crosse, which is about 30 miles away. <clears throat> And I spend about, I started spending about three days a week there and uh, four days here. And I started, um, I didn't use my Buddhist name, Dokai, when I was signing up for like uh, exercise classes, Zumba classes at the Y and, um, and yoga classes. I used my, my, the name my mom and dad gave me, Ron. And um, thinking, it, I don't want to be seen as a Zen teacher, just an ordinary person uh, with no special uh, status. And so I did that. And now it's been about four or five years since then. And now there's, because I live in a small, La Crosse is not a big town, like 50,000, 51,000. And of course, where I live is is even less, way less. <clears throat> and there's been some crossover, like the people in yoga, some of the people, not very many, but a small, very small handful, know me as Dokai from Hokyoji. And so now I've had to make the decision to what name do I, am I gonna use? <laughs> So, so I had to change back to I changed back to Dokai. But anyway, it's it kind of gave me the example. There's no no escaping. Now the only other escape could be if I did like Dharma pe field people do and just called myself Ron all the time, like Steve does and Norm does and um, everyone and all the rest of the people. <clears throat> In any event, uh, it's just a little anecdote about not being able to uh, escape our the clothing that we wear. So about this uh, perfume, he says, we often don't like the smells that perfume the air around us, so we resist them. We say we want to be free, but the kind of freedom that includes such resistance is questionable. True freedom is not found in the air that surrounds you. You find it by noticing how you resist the perfume of others. And then moment to moment, you let yourself breathe whatever perfume fills the air. Um, so this is a, a challenging practice, probably the most challenging practice. I don't think our Zen practice is particularly, in some ways, it's not particularly hard to understand. In some ways it is, but in other ways it isn't. So we notice uh, how we resist the perfume of others. Now this is really I think the ultimate Zen practice, because it's really uh, others, or I'll even say other people, usually, that um, create the most difficulty for us, the perfume of their existence. At least that's, I'm just speaking from personal experience. I used to work as a nurse and um, 
I would say, you know, if you put a a grading scale, I would say like I was a grading scale of a, a C minus nurse. Uh, it was hard work, but I had the opportunity to work with um, a lot of other people who I thought were A plus nurses. They just were so sensitive to the patient's needs that I, it was totally amazing to me. <clears throat> and I probably don't have to go into a lot of graphic detail, but there was a lot of smells and tastes, and not tastes, but smells and sights that were not very pleasant to, uh, to uh, experience when you're a nurse. <clears throat> I was just struck by how a lot of my companions were just not moved by these kind of very unpleasant uh, things that had to be dealt with when they were dealing with the, the patients. Now, a little later, you know, in the break room, you know, maybe we would make a, a joke about something that was really hard, but in the presence of the uh, patient, there was no, no um, altercation of, uh, in the in the of what you're presented with, at least with those folks, me, I I struggled a bit. It did remind me of a a passage I read about the life of Mother Teresa, where she said uh, some younger um, one of her. Um, disciples or, or nuns, however it works, uh, was picking off some maggots of a wound of one of, uh, you know, a, basically a homeless person in Calcutta. Uh, I don't think it's called Calcutta anymore. Cal well, anyway, it, anyway, Cal I don't know what it's called, but um, in any event, uh, she was kind of wincing and you know, that kind of icky kind of thing. And she says, don't do that. You know, this is the body of Christ. And uh, when I read that, I, I was really deeply moved by that. It's like, you know, Christ isn't somebody, you know, way up in the air, um, at least in her opinion. It's just this uh, homeless person lying on the bed with maggots in the in the wound and pulling them out as needed. <clears throat> so I think this is really the practice of uh, Zen Buddhism. Like I say, it's not so profound, really. It's just how do we deal with the very challenging circumstances that present us every day? Sometimes uh, within our own sanghas as well. Maybe that's most of it. Some of it, of course, comes from our families. And some of it comes from looking at the world and our situation. Kadagiri goes on to say, we sometimes have the idea that if we don't think of ourselves first, we will fall behind. But the more we try to get ahead, the more exhausted we become. We cannot escape self-centered ideas. I've given up uh, the idea of trying to get ahead these days. I'm just trying to keep even. And that in itself seems to uh, be a challenge. Just uh, doing the dishes, cooking food, taxes, car repairs, computer issues, trying to just keep uh, moving evenly.
so yeah, um, <clears throat> the self-centered idea here is, uh, is not that I want to get ahead, but I don't want to fall behind, so far behind. So instead of denying or destroying the self, we must ask, how can we use our selfish self in simple, practical way? To use the selfish self compassionately is the practice of Zen Buddhism. Compassion is like spring water coming up from the ground, and it can be used to sustain everyone. Sometimes we might waver, believing if that's true or not, depending on our personal situation. Compassion is like spring water coming up from the ground, and it can be used to sustain everyone. There's other places where Kadigiri uses this uh, simile. Compassion is like spring water coming up from the ground endlessly. We have a spring here at Hokyochi. It's been here since, since I got here in 1980. and just seems to continuously uh, come up from the ground. He really uh, appreciated that metaphor or simile. But even if we learn to use our life for all sentient beings, we may still have a sense of self selfishness. I'm using my selfishness for everyone, that's an idea. I am saving all sentient beings. Well, he says, uh, it's better to just help others without leaving any trace. There's no reason to think I am doing this for others. Well, that's true. I mean, that's a good recipe for burnout if we are carrying that uh, conception around with us that uh, I'm really doing this for the benefit of all beings when we're actually suffering ourselves. <clears throat> in the original Buddhism, in the Kayas, uh, the Buddha says a, um, a statement that's quite uh, moving for me. He says, the conceit I am is abandoned and all eye-making activity ceases. And just those simple words are just so striking to me. Just the, he, the Buddha saw or experienced that just this idea that I am is conceitful. Now we usually don't see it that way, but he's seeing things on a different scope. Just to assert that I am is conceit. I'm not going to evaluate that as good or bad, but it's just, that's what it is. And then he talks about uh, abandoning uh, all, uh, ceasing all eye-making activity. Now, this is where I think uh, Zazen really is good practice for us. And it's like a perfume. It's it's doing something, but we're not quite aware of it, especially if we wear it uh, subtly. Because when we do Zazen, we can see the vastness of the eye-making activity. And we see it even more clearly when we actually, when our mind actually um, settles down more, our mind and body. When they settle down, we see the uh, vast, uh, vast, uh, I'm gonna, a word I like from original Buddhism too is craving, the vast craving um, for, um, that we have. Speak a little bit about that a little later.
I think I will. So in other words, you have to extend your idea of self to include everyone and everything. Well, this is our how the uh, our practice is uh, can be very challenging. For instance, uh, consider a baby and its mother. The baby offers no words. She doesn't say, I'm hungry, sleepy, I have a stomach ache. She doesn't say anything. She just cries. And behind her crying, the mother understands what she wants. At that time, she can establish the self that is exactly the same as that of others, as her baby. What is the true self of the mother? of the baby, they are exactly the same. So that's a, a metaphor, again, Kadigiri is, is using, but it's not different from me or anyone else. We have to understand the cries that people are making, even if uh, there's no words. I'm going to go on and talk a few um, few sentences from the next chapter called Egolessness. Impermanence, the fact that everything is constantly changing, is one of Buddha's main teachings. It is not so easy to stand up in this world of constant change. Nothing lasts, not our bodies, not our minds, not our likes or our dislikes. If this is true, how should we live? Well, the last chapter was called uh, Using the Selfish Self, and this one's called Egolessness. So, if this is true, how should we live? And then he says, in egolessness. Egolessness is not about destroying or ignoring the subject subjective side of life. It means noticing that subjectivity is intimately related to what appears out there. In other words, both the subject me and the object that exist together beyond our likes and dislikes. The important point then is how to exist within this realm that comprises both self and object, or subject and object. In other words, how can we live in peace and harmony? And this is why Again, why Zazen is so important for us to do, I believe, because we can see the vastness of the, the craving that emerges. And I particularly do appreciate this word craving. And the Buddha speaks about three kinds of craving. One is the craving for sensual pleasures. And one is the craving for existence, and one is craving for non-existence. And these uh, are very important, uh, I'll say, models or maps or conceptual maps for me. Uh, the craving for sensual pleasures, okay, that one I'm not going to go get into. I think we all have a pretty firm understanding of that. However, the craving for existence, now this one is, uh, I think, getting into a more subtle place. And again, I'd like to go back to Zazen and ask you to consider what's going on when you're doing Zazen. Are there thoughts about eye making activity? I would suspect there, there are, if you're anything like me, lots of uh, eye-making activity. And this eye-making eye -making activity, if we examine it, 
closely. They're, they're about stories. They're about the stories we create during Zazen. And if we examine those stories, I think inevitably we will find the subject of that story is myself. Just examine that sometime when you're doing Zazen. See if there's any story you create that where you're not the center of attention. I haven't found that yet in any kind of story I create. Even if it's about, you know, my brother or my sister or parents or something. It's usually about me and my relationship to them. So this is the, when I, when I say about this, I make an activity, it's like the craving for existence, the craving that I am something. It's very, it's very interesting. And I, I just, I can't think of any other word except just craving. There's just a craving for it. And even when we become quiet in Zazen, to a, to a degree where that usually doesn't occur. It won't be long before we will start to create something like, wow, this is, this is really nice. I like this. <laughs> this is the way it's supposed to be. But still, that's just the beginning of more craving. That's how subtle it is. After that, when we get uh, really, really tired of everything that happens in Zazen, like it's just the same old thing going on and on and on over and over and over again. And this might happen more often like doing a long retreat, like seven days or so. Then we might generate um, a longing or craving for non-existence. I mean, I just want this to end. This It's just too much suffering. Just constantly creating the same ideas about the world over and over again. We can experience this in Zazen too, where we just get tired of it. And then, then we crave for non-existence. But it's the same kind of craving from a different angle, different perspective. So the point is, how do we sit there and just not, we stop the uh, cycle of craving? The world is completely beyond our likes and dislikes. All things work together as a dynamic whole. Because of impermanence, of thoroughgoing change, there is nothing to hold on to. In Buddhism, we say everything is empty. All emptiness is, is just constant change. Now that's what I, I think that's about the best definition of emptiness that I can, uh, I've heard. It's just, all it is, is constant change. Because there's nothing that's singularly existing as its own entity for even a moment. Yep. And that's just how it is. But don't think you can understand emptiness with concepts. There is no way to grasp it. So that is to say, even if we say emptiness is constant change, we're still relegating it to the conceptual world. So we just have to experience that. And have to stand up in that place. The depth of human life is ungraspable. Well, I've talked for 35 minutes.
I think I've done my job. <laughs> Although I didn't get a job description. But in any event, uh, I'd like to open it up for um, comments. Uh, I sometimes said, I've said this a number of times. I don't know if I've said it here, but I grew up in the Methodist tradition. And uh, we had a sermon, you know, every every Sunday. The length of that sermon was uh, no longer than 15 minutes. Uh, I don't know if any of you had that experience, but then when I got into Buddhism, you, Buddhism is like you talk for an hour. <laughs> and I say, what in the world can you say for an hour that you can't say in 15 minutes? I never, never understood it. Well, after you listen to Katagiri Roshi for years and years and years, you'll you'll kind of get a, a a sense of that why it goes on for an hour. And anyway, I'm not inclined to speak for an hour, so um, <clears throat> I would invite any comments or questions. And uh, I might have trouble seeing your hands or something, so someone might have to guide me through that. Someone kind of monitor. I don't know quite how you do it. You can also rebut. I'm always open to rebuttals. Do okay. Yeah. I I like your um, uh, simple no nonsense <laughs> approach. Um. I have a question about meditation. Um, or whenever I'm relaxed, really relaxed, I I hear a kind of a ringing in my ear. It's not tinnitus, but uh, um, it's uh, I think it's called nada in some traditions. And um, when I um. um immerse myself in that sound um a, a lot of the uh cares and uh, concerns of daily life just vanish um I'm, I'm wondering is it does this have anything is there any role for this in zen thought or tradition well I uh, I haven't had that experience. I, I I've had a a little bit of tinnitus in my life, but it resolves, you know, in a few seconds, uh, or yeah, probably something like seconds. Uh, I'm not sure I would appreciate having that experience during zazen, but uh, maybe you're lucky. I don't know. Uh, but it seems as it seems as if it's a particular sensation that you're focusing on. And yeah, I, I think that's, you know, that's sort of what happens in Zazen. We get focused on something. Mm -hmm. uh, and we don't have to <clears throat> explain it. We just, we know that this is uh, like, a, 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 we're, we're touching reality more closely than everything that we're fabricating in our minds. The Buddha has a very interesting uh, sutta. I think it's the shortest sutta I've ever read. It's one sentence. It says, um, how do we know something is fabricated? And he says, it has a beginning, it has an end, and it has an alteration through its course of existence and it's fabricated and then he says so that's the whole sutra and then there's another one that says what's uh the unfabricated and he says uh the beginning and the end and the alter alteration altercation alteration of the the state is not uh, known in other words there's not a beginning not an end or not variation and that's what we call unfabricated. So 
I think it's the unfabricated that we're trying to understand. Because we fabricated is pretty, uh, pretty easy. We understand that pretty well. We're fabricating things all the time. But the unfabricated is a little more challenging to uh, to grasp or to uh, to see or to experience. But to me, that sounds like what you're talking about, just through the practice of uh, concentrating on one thing directly we see how we create so many things in our mind that are not really in connection with reality. I don't know if that helps or not. Well, in my case, um, it doesn't involve will at all. I just, um, it's, I acquiesce silently and um, the, I don't try to make anything out of it. Mm -hmm. But I find it very reassuring um, in the, it has no content. <laughs> it's it's just a sound. Mm -hmm. But not, I'm not sure it's a really a sound. Uh, mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, it's not like tinnitus. Yeah. Um, uh, but I find it very reassuring. And I just sort of uh, surrender to it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, things like sight and sound are still uh, fabrications of our mind. I mean, things we call those things. <laughs> I mean, really, it's like, okay, let's get down to the bottom of it. There's really not much going. It's pretty, pretty empty out there. <laughs> but it's actually where the fullness of a life uh, resides, I believe. Because if we're if we have our mind full of ideas, we can't really meet anything, a person or a thing or an idea. I think with uh, openness. Okay, how do we work through this? So we, our minds have to be pretty uh, clear of all of its fabrications and my own ideas. I like that. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you for your question, Peter. Okay, we have a question here in Dharma Field. Okay, I'm not seeing where it's coming from. Is it coming from your room there? Or... Yeah, can you see the room? I see the room. Yeah, <laughs> I see the waving hand. <laughs> I barely, barely. I don't have very good eyesight. But, uh... yeah, okay. We okay. were just, um, good morning, uh, good morning. Dokai. I'm Christine. Um, we were just discussing this um, I believe Thursday morning in our discussion group here reading um, uh, Returning to Silence, uh, one of the chapters and the delineations of um, clinging came up and you brought that up again today. And I guess in my mind, I'm wondering if that clinging or craving for existence and then non-existence, if when you pose those examples together, if they're considered to be opposites of one another or just examples of how we experience uh, clinging. I would say not opposites. I would say different aspects of the same thing, even though we don't think they are. Uh, that's how I perceive them. Um, the, the craving for existence. Um, we can experience it how about two different ways. One is like during Zazen when life, you know, is basically just going along um, the way it normally does and we set aside our hour or whatever to meditate. Another aspect of realizing that is when we have a severe loss or severe trauma of it, we we notice just that you know the constant craving to understand uh, something 
why, you know, why, whatever. Uh, so it's kind of a, you know, a kind of a craving too. It's different. And then, well, <clears throat> the craving for non-existence, um, of course, uh, we all know people who who have suffered so deeply that that uh, they believe that ending their life will be uh, a, you know will be a way to end their suffering. So that's uh, but it's not unrelated, I don't think to to me either. Just uh, I want this to stop. You know, something like that still happens now kind of like you know just I speak of retirement and it's like I kind of don't want to do all this stuff anymore that's that's kind of hard to do I kind of like to just sit back and relax for my last whatever many of years I have left but it, it's uh so it's still kind of a craving. And so, no, I don't think the craving for non-existence is kind of opposite. I think it's the same thing from a different perspective. That's how I would put it. I don't know if that answers or addresses your question or not. Was it Christy? Is that who you is? Christine. Christine. Okay. Thank you. You're welcome. Okay, uh, I think I'll pass it back to uh, Steve. All right, thank you so much, Doka. Pleasure as always. <clears throat>